you and Okay, let's do it again. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I am so glad you are here in this space. Thank you for um, attending our presentation. Uh, let me just go ahead and do some uh, screen sharing. Hopefully you can all see that. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you again. And I'm so excited to be doing this for um, Open Texas 2022 and really excited to do this presentation with my awesome team at Michigan State University. So first off, my name is Regina Gong. I am the OER and Student Success Librarian at MSU, and I am here with uh, my colleagues Joshua Newman, Julie Taylor, and Shandley uh, Marcik Taylor, who are all going to tell you about the awesome work that we are doing um, at MSU with regards to OER publishing. So let me go ahead and start now. So, um, you know, while we we are a team here presenting um, this morning, uh, we have other members uh, of the OER team at MSU who is also part of, of the team at uh, our OER program and um, our senior associate dean for scholarly communication and faculty affairs, Arlene, is um, here <laughs> in this presentation. So hi, Arlene. Uh, we also have um, one of our librarian colleagues, Heidi Schroeder, who is doing um, accessibility. And, you know, we will tell you more about the work that we do with regards to accessibility in a little a bit. And like what Carrie has mentioned, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat and we are going to monitor it, answer it within the chat or answer it live. But we are also going to um, have plenty of time for um, Q&A. That is really my favorite uh, part of any presentation that I do, our conversations. So, uh, just a little bit of a background with uh, our OER program. Uh, it, is, it was formally launched in October 2019. Some of you may know that um, I moved uh, to MSU from nine years of working at Lansing State Lansing Community College, uh, where I also led a very successful OER program. But the difference is that at MSU, you know, we, Jasmine, talk about labor in OER. Um, this is a full-time position for me. So really have, um, you know, lots of time to really shape the, the trajectory of the OER program. And, you know, I have an awesome team who works with the OER uh, program. Um, you know, we have a publishing coordinator for print-on-demand services. That's Julie Taylor. And we have a publishing assistant and copy editor who is um, Josh Newman. And we also have an accessibility coordinator and editor, um, and that's Shandley. And we also have student employees who do, you know, a variety of work in our OER publishing program. So I have a $50,000 um, annual fund to um, help our faculty or incentivize our faculty to um, create and adopt OER. And we are also an institutional member of the Open Educational, Open <laughs> Education Network, OEN. And most recently, we are part of the OpenStax Institutional Partnership Program. So just to walk you through the OER program goals. You know, I can summarize it as affordability, accessibility, equity, and faculty innovation. So the labor that goes into OER is more than just the physical, you know, intellectual labor. We also aim to provide that technical infrastructure for our faculty to successfully uh, publish and create uh, their OER. 
So these are the services we offer. And I'm not gonna go through all of them, but uh, really I am proud of the fact that we are able to fully support our faculty in terms of technology, the platform, and other professional development opportunities that um, enhances their knowledge about open education and open pedagogy. Um, you know, as you know, I'm very big on assessment and, and tracking of OER adoption. So um, so you can see here it's a little bit fuzzy because this is taken from the um, Excel sheet that I maintain. So if you notice, I keep track of um, OER adoptions for fall 2019. I haven't done the fall 2020 to um, adoption figures yet, but I will do that soon. Um, but you can see that we have a robust number of faculty and courses that are using OER. So as I've said, this is an incentive award for um, our faculty, one of the pillars of our OER program at MSU. And these are the categories of um, levels of uh, support or incentive that we provide to our faculty. So it ranges from a thousand to five thousand dollars. And if you need to see how that works, I have the link there to the OER lib guide. And you know, just to give you an idea of the total award that we have um, provided our faculty. Um, so it started in 2019 to 2020 academic year. So I always have a year in advance of awarding the program, uh, the the award, because you know, of course, we want to give our faculty time to to create the OER that they are um, going to use in their courses. So the last uh, round was last year for implementation this fall 2022. And the fourth round would be, um, I plan to open the call for proposals uh, right around uh, mid-October. Yes, October 15. And this is the um, open textbooks site that we have. So we have a press books um, instance. Um, we subscribe to, to you know, the top tier of uh, press books subscription. We have then titles that are already published currently, and we have numerous titles underway that is waiting to be released. So watch out for that. And you know, just to give you an idea of the OER production workflow, we created it to guide us and to guide our, our faculty authors with regards to what are the steps, what are the tasks needed in order for them to be successful in their OER creation work. And this and this workflow is available in the OER LibGuide. So you can download it as a PDF, um, remix and revise as, um, as appropriate to you, to your context. Okay, so now that you have an idea more or less of um, our OER program, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, um, Shanley to talk about accessibility. Hi, everyone. Um, while I'm here talking to you about accessibility and keeping with the theme of the conference, I really do want to acknowledge all of the labor beyond just mine that is involved in making our OER more accessible. So the first step is that our authors are encouraged to follow guidelines from the start, um, because every element that we have to go back and fix takes time. And it's obviously more efficient to make choices from the start that are accessible rather than rely on me alone to clean up color contrast tables, all that kind of thing. So we do have multiple authors who have created books with us, multiple books with us already. And I do see them responding to the feedback with each book we put out. Um, so once they've more or less finalized the content for the semester, Regina submits it to Heidi Schro Schroeder, the library's accessibility coordinator who supervises incredible student employees who generate 
reports like the one pictured on this slide and the next. Next slide, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, so this is the slide showing the report for Basic Hindi. The text on the left has frankly turned the boilerplate that I don't read, as it is the same on all the reports that they generate. But when preparing for this presentation, I refresh my memory and appreciate all over again the work that they do. Um, so reports can take several multi-hour shifts to generate and refer to our accessibility checklist, which is easily Googleable and under a Creative Commons license. Um, so discovering heading um, hierarchy errors to most missing all text, the hours of work they do helps me go directly to the source of various issues. For one report with a ton of tables that had no headings, they even helpfully linked every single table in the report, which was great. Um, so on the right, you'll see that there are no accessibility errors less, listed, which we always try to target, but there are alerts. Um, these vary in difficulty to address, as you can imagine. Um, for example, underlying something is something that authors can avoid in the first place, and anyone who can make the underlining knows how to remove underlining. Um, but an advantage of Pressbooks is that it has a robust visual editor and text editor, so even authors who hate seeing under the hood of their books, so to speak, can implement some basic accessibility measures like headings. Um, being aware of semantic markup generally, um, for example, using strong instead of bold, um, B for bold HTML tagging is helpful as well, depending, um, depending on what platform you might be using. But in Pressbooks, that is automatic. So just check into your platforms that you're using. Um, so layout tables, on the other hand, can be a total toss up because adding a table heading can be simple and can be done in the visual editor without any HTML knowledge. Then to be frank, it wasn't intuitive to me at first. So thank you, Julie, for showing me the button <laughs> where it is. Um, however, some tables are just useless to screen readers, and you just have to reimagine them with the help of the author. Next slide, please. Um, so I'll be honest with you. I greatly appreciate the importance of making OER more accessible, but I was essentially starting from scratch when it came to the skills needed to actually make some of the changes indicated. Um, moreover, once I acquired said skills, which primarily include a higher degree of fluency with HTML tags while working on language textbooks, there's no getting around the fact that eight hours a week is really a drop in the bucket for affecting changes in the number of books we're putting out. Uh, we hope that we'll be able to hire a student employee focused on accessibility to help implement, implement changes more quickly as well. Um, so the screenshot on this slide is an example of tagging languages. Again, this is an example of how I learned from the students who issue these accessibility reports. I referred to their examples extensively as I was learning the ropes of how to tag languages, which is certainly more finicky than the changes that authors can easily affect themselves in the Pressbooks visual editor. Next slide, please. So at this moment, I've been focusing on our many language textbooks like Chinese, Arabic, and Urdu, simply because the labor involved in adding language tags easily fills the time to work on OER that I have. Um, and that can make or break a student's experience in a way that an underlined word probably wouldn't. So each incoming cohort of authors receives a reference sheet from us, um, screenshotted on the left, um, that is ideally going to help prevent common accessibility issues from being baked into their books. So the current version screenshot on the slide um, is going to be revised shortly. Um, one thing that I'd like to add is a note about tables because making a table heading is really easy as you're going along. Making captions is pretty easy as you're going along and doing it at that point is easier than me going back and finding all those missing elements. Next slide, please. <laughs> So parsing accessibility reports. You probably won't be surprised that the accessibility report screenshots shared on the earlier slides are partial. Uh, we had some experiences with authors who were genuinely invested in accessibility to the point that at least one of them was an accessibility fellow. Um, and they were just completely demoralized by the long reports of all the errors and alerts. Um, so that was what my role was env originally envisioned as doing. Regina needs someone who could read the report make more complex changes that require zero subject matter knowledge and let her know where the fact they really needed to step up. 
For example, I'm not going to attempt to describe a complex scientific diagram in alt text, but she'll give the author the nudge necessary to get it done. Next slide, please. So this screenshot um, shows you the visual editor I've been referring to. Um, so basically, a, one um, author used a ton of bright red headings and a brick red, and I changed it to a brick red um, that actually complied with WCAG color contrast guidelines. Um, and it was very easily um, easy to see why the author chose that color, but it's not actually accessible. So, so while Pressbooks is good at some things like the strong semantic heading, um, it does allow you to make um, accessibility errors, I suppose. Um, so if you have any questions about my experience, um, please feel free to contact me. Um, and my contact information should be on the last slide. Um, the How We Can Help Authors title of this slide should really be applied to everyone's work on this team. Um, so I just like to introduce the printing publishing um, um, coordinator, Julie Taylor. Thank you, Chanley. Next slide. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm Julie Taylor, the publishing services coordinator at the libraries, and I overlap my duties with our OEO, OER program as well. Um, we use, as Regina mentioned, we use Pressbooks as our publishing platform, and we've had really good feedback from the students about how easy it is to access and navigate, and also the options that they like for downloading uh, the files or just viewing them online. One of the bonuses of having publishing services and print on demand um, equipment right here housed in the libraries is that we can make physical copies of the books right here on demand. Um, you saw that we have services for authors um, with help with press books formatting. Um, I also help assign ISBNs and supervise the students who does um, cover design and um, some additional formatting fixes. Uh, Josh and Chanley do editing and accessibility. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so publishing services does print on demand for paperback books and booklets for our general community but we also do it for the OER open books as well. Um, part of the other th services we offer are consultations for self-publishers, uh, file formatting and conversion. Uh, we teach book design through workshops that are free and also have some uh, videos online um, for people who can't attend the workshops and then additionally supply OER support. So we wear multiple hats in the library sometimes. Next slide. Um, one of the contributions talking about student labor uh, is creating cover designs for these books um, and not just one design. We will give the authors a variety of covers to choose from and then we can uh, work with them if they have um, tweaks that we, they want to make. Um, for example, we had a French book or a French language textbook where they wanted to decentralize France and so instead of having it be you know, red, white, and blue with pictures of France, uh, we really tried to open it up and scale it to like all the other countries in the world that use French as their primary language. Um, and so making sure that the cover reflects that uh, intent of the, the content. Um, so our students in the past, besides doing cover design, have also done um, equation formatting. Um, right now, I have a student who is going through an italicizing um, case laws at for a criminal justice book. I don't really know all the details of it, but I know she's uh, going back and fixing some italicization. Um, in the future, we will have a student doing some of those accessibility fixes to help Chanley with uh, fixing colors or uh, language tags. And also they help with um, book production when, when we are doing uh, print runs. Next slide. Thank you. Um, if you're curious about our print on demand publication printing services, um, we have um, two pricing structures, one for university accounts where they're paying at cost, and then also for uh, non-departmental public patron pricing. Uh, and we have a pricing calculator there, uh, which I'm sure Joshua or someone will link in the chat for me. And um, you can just see that it really doesn't cost that much to have a book printed even on demand, there's no minimums. They can just print one copy of the book. And Pressbooks makes it easy. Once you have all the text formatted in Pressbooks, you can export them and have them downloadable as um, 
PDFs, eBooks. Once I get a PDF, it's easy just to send it to the printer and, and get a physical copy made. Do I have any other slides? I think I'm switching it over to Joshua next. So Joshua was hired in, well, I'll let him tell. There you go, thank you. Thank you, Julie. Hello, I'm Joshua Newman. I am the OER editor and publishing assistant at MSU Libraries. Um, I was hired in specifically to edit OERs and help Regina in the production of the OER textbooks. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I do. Um, I'm starting with, um, I'm not a sub subject area expert on all these books. I am a language expert. I specialize in English language and English grammar um, and communication. And that is primarily how I focus on these projects. I am making sure that the ideas and the concepts that the author is trying to convey to the students is clearly um, communicated. And it's really easy when you're talking about complex topics to be caught up in the context inside of your head. So I have the perspective of someone who's new to a lot of these topics, and I can deduce, you know, if I can't understand a, a concept from what I'm reading in the book, we can assume the students aren't going to, you know, understand that concept very well either. So I do my best to make sure that ideas are communicated clearly um, in the way that the author intended. You can go ahead and go to the next slide, Regina. Thank you. So primarily, I do a lot of copy editing and proofreading. Um, this is the kind of like small things um, that you would edit out, grammar, punctuation, spelling, double spaces, small formatting things, anything that's redundant. Um, I've had examples of sentences where kind of the same idea was communicated twice, so I can condense that into a single sentence. Um, and then I make sure that we are conforming to the style that's necessary for the subject area. A lot of different subject areas use a specific style. Primarily, I use CMS, which is the Chicago Manual of Style, um, unless the author specifies otherwise. Next slide, Regina. Thank you. Um, so when I'm editing, I will, like I said, I will read the book. I do read the each project cover to cover, which can be very time consuming. It can be difficult to clearly lay out a timeline for each project because of this workflow. Um, each project is very different. Each author writes very differently. They're all different lengths, um, and they're all different different topics with different areas that I can or can't um, help with, such as foreign language books that are in a non-Roman script where um, there are these blocks of text that I simply cannot be helpful with because I don't read that. Like I'm not a polyglot. I don't speak five languages. Um, so I do my best with the English portions that are communicating the ideas to um, to English students, English speaking students, I should say. So for the consultations and queries while I'm editing, sometimes I do run across these things that they just kind of look wrong. They seem kind of awkward. I'm not sure how to change it because I don't want to change the meaning of any of the information because I'm not a subject area expert. I have to make sure when I change something that the meaning stays the same to what the authors intended. So I will send those types of um, issues as queries directly to the author and say, you know, this is, this seems weird to me. Um, this is what I think you're trying to say. This might be a better way to say that. And then ultimately they make the choice and they can have me change it or they can go back in and change it themselves. A good example of this is a foreign language book I was editing recently where the author referred to natural gender versus grammatical gender when they were talking about um, grammatical gender in the language structure. So a lot of foreign languages will use um, gendered nouns, and that informs the structure of how you will um, put the sentences together. And um, obviously referring to natural gender when you mean biological sex can um, be harmful to someone um, if, you know, it's making them feel like the, the concept of gender can be unnatural. And these are the types of things that I can catch that an author might not necessarily be able to catch. So we changed that to biological sex and we fixed the issue and the idea was still communicated properly. Um, go ahead, Jul or, or Regina, sorry, up to the next slide, thank you. So um, this is the OER style guide, which I created to help our authors as they are developing I did notice some questions in the chat about the labor of um, who is making changes. And um, when you try and push back labor onto the authors, that can go awry. So we encountered the same problem when we were developing the program. And 
we felt that it was going to be most productive to try and nip these things in the bud as soon as possible while, you know, during the development stage, while it's being created. So any of the resources that we could provide with the authors to make sure that they are, like Chanley said, baking the stuff in from the get-go, the less we have to change later. So this is one of those things that we did to be like, hey, these are really common things. We have to spend time changing. This is how you should use them. Um, and this is how you should not use them. So as you create your, your book, um, you can be aware of these issues from the get-go. I think that's my last slide. It is. <laughs> Thank you. Turning it back to Regina now. Thank you. Thank you, Shandley, Julie, and Josh. Um, you know, if if you want, um, if you need us to clarify some more um, things that might have prompted you know, questions uh, from you from this presentation, um, you know, feel free to contact us. This is our um, emails. So I'm going to stop the share and really just want to to engage with you, um, you know, regarding things that you might have questions with. Um, I, I forgot to add that um, our faculty, OER authors, the ones who get uh, the OER award, uh, OER award for a particular academic year, you know, really work closely with us. So from the get go, uh, we have a very um, robust onboarding process. So we do what we call a kickoff. So it's a kickoff training where, you know, they meet all of us in the team. So that's like Arlene, Heidi, myself, Shandley, Josh, and Julie. And we, you know, I, I talk to them about the expectations. And as I have mentioned earlier in the chat, as I was answering Sarah's um, questions, accessibility is built in in the application. They have to agree that they are going to conform with accessibility standards that the OER that they are um, creating should, should have. And so uh, they know from the get-go that, you know, it's, it's part and parcel of, of their, their work. But um, we also let them know that this is an, an ongoing project. You know, we are not aiming for perfection here. <laughs> so, you know, every step of their work, we are here to help them so that they can learn and we can learn from each other. So I think that is what we emphasize and really emphasize the idea that we are in this together. So a lot of our faculty, of course, they are content experts. They know what you know, they, they know the, the content, they know the things that their students need to learn, but maybe not necessarily um, familiar, especially with, you know, OER authoring tools, in this case, Pressbooks. So we also do like a training for them on Pressbooks. So some of the faculty who uh, got trained initially with Pressbooks, you know, basic and intermed intermediate H5P, once they like get the hang of it, they just like, wow, you know, this is like amazing. And they just create all of these awesome, awesome exercises that are built in into their OER. Okay, I will stop talking. And if you want, if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself. And there, I'm just going to take a look at the chat. There are a couple of questions that came in in chat. Um, I think you've addressed the first two with regarding the workflow and the full time positions. Um, but one of the other recent ones that came in is, can you talk about how you got support from your upper administration to move so heavily into OER and get funded for positions dedicated to OER production? Oh my God, that is really a good question. And are you ready? <laughs> so um, 
really I owe this to the support of the library administration. And I am gonna talk about, you know, Arlene as our associate dean and our dean at the time, um, you know, Dr. Joe Salem, who has since moved on to Duke University. Um, they really are aware that in order to move an OER initiative forward, especially in a land grant R1 institution, such as MSU, you really need to fund the program. And so initially, we got $50,000 um, as uh, funding to, to help uh, support our faculty in the ways they want to engage with OER. That came from our provost office, right, Arlene? Yes. And then so for two years, that came from our provost office. And now on our third year, it is now coming off from the library's uh, budget. So it is an ongoing commitment to have that, that funding for, for at least, you know, helping our faculty. As to the positions, we are fortunate that we have that capacity to hire for folks. I mean, Josh's position is new and we are able to really capitalize on his skills and expertise because that is what I feel is missing in a lot of OER programs, the copy editing. You know, we need to have that um, labor, so to speak, to be able to produce really good OER. And my other colleagues, Julie, She's, oh, the tra a train is coming, so I'm sorry about if you hear it, <laughs> um, but Julie is in publishing services. We have the capacity at MSU to print on demand, and, you know, that is, a, I, I think, a strength uh, because we have that physical infrastructure, the technology, the platform to be able to support our faculty and our students. Thank you, Regina. There was a similar question, and, and you may have addressed it. So, Simon, if um, if you if we need to expand on it, but the follow up question or additional question was, can you speak as to the funding model for this OER publishing process? And I know you touched a little bit on that, but I didn't know if you wanted to speak more to that. Yeah, so uh, we have an OER award program. As I mentioned, uh, a lot of the OER activities that are being done at MSU are creation. So we provide $4,000 for faculty OER creation, of course, to create new OER. And um, recently, we have quite a few who are doing adaptation. So, but if if I have to quantify it, 80% of uh, the folks who get the award are creating OER. And the $5,000 there that I sh I've, you know, I've shown you in the earlier slide is for scaling up OER. Um, that means that uh, if, if, all sections of a particular course are going to use OER, then that is a $5,000 grant. One of the things too that we've added as a category is the continuous improvement grant. So say for example, for um, you know this academic year, Author X got um, funding for OER creation and then the OER was created we have the capacity for them to apply for a continuous improvement OER grant. That essentially is that, you know, improve upon the work so that the things that they might have uh, missed or not dealt with in the original OER that they created can be enhanced. Does that answer your question? I hope so. If not, I will try again. I see a question and there's some answers starting to come in through chat. So maybe Julie and Arlene can expand on this, but do you collaborate or work with MSU Press? 
Um, what I can say about this is that the press just started reporting to the libraries um, this year. They came to the libraries um, with the thought that they needed some greater oversight in terms of how they are managing their budget and so forth. So they have greater pressure to perform in terms of self-funding that the OER program really doesn't have. So we're going to um, have some, some discussions uh, about uh, potential collaborations, but um, right now they're pretty much uh, separate entities with separate um, missions. Julie, do you want to talk more? I just put in chat that uh, publishing services has provided print on demand uh, printing for their ARCs, their advanced reader copies, and some marketing materials. Um, the library also has an in house graphic design person and in house printer for um, internal facing um, marketing materials as well. Uh, but the press and the OER program right now are, are kind of separate, as Arlene mentioned. So Sarah asks, um, Josh asks what your title is again, and then wondering if you are willing to share the job descriptions. Job we don't have any objections to sharing the job descriptions. Regina can send them out to attendees. Yeah, Joshua was hired. Uh, he reports to me as the publishing services coordinator so that Regina can really focus on the interactions with the faculty. Um, and that doesn't distract her from like day to day supervision. Um, Joshua helps me. I think it's a 10 or 20% uh, reporting to me to help with production and then reports 80% to the OER program uh, to facilitate those editing needs. Chanley also works with our course materials program and that is her primary assignment. Um, and then the OER is, is it 10 or 20%, something like that? Um, yeah. And I put my title there in the chat. I didn't want to just say it out loud. I wanted to make sure it was referenceable. So it is in there now. And just to steal a moment, um, our makerspace made a model of our printing equipment. So we have a printer, a binder, and a trimmer uh, right in the next room. So I can make books within the next hour if I needed to. Yeah, and, and also, you know, speaking to the labor of, of OER. So um, at MSU, at least, you know, in, 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 our OPR, in our OER program, I really try to embody the objectives or the goals of, of um, you know, our program to really foster um, diversity, equity, um, inclusion, and social justice. And so one of the ways in which we are um, really uh, <laughs> making change in that is although not formally um, written in the faculty's uh, promotion and tenure uh, guidelines, uh, we are able to have uh, our OER, OER uh, authors recognize in our annual uh, faculty um, what is that? Faculty appreciation. Uh, faculty book reception. Facu faculty book reception. So before the OER program, of course, you know, the, the works that are being recognized are, you know, works that were created by faculty uh, with, you know, the commercial publishers, right? A lot of our authors are scholars, top in their field. But since we have now the OER program and we are publishing OER written by um, our faculty, uh, most of which are not 
on the tenure track. So we are able to add the work that they do as part of that. So what Julie does, I don't know, Julie, if you have like a show and tell uh, OER book. So what we do is we print. Yay, okay. Uh, if you can turn your attention to Julie's show and tell while, while I talk. Um, so Julie prints uh, the OER that are uh, being recognized. So it's, it's gonna be next week, actually, the annual faculty book reception. And give, uh, what do you call that? Uh, complimentary copy to our faculty authors and also allows them to, um, do we give them like 10 copies or whatever so that they can distribute it to their family and friends? Uh, yeah, and, and they really appreciate that recognition because the work that they do in creating OER, to me, is rivals whatever um, work that they do, you know, via publisher contract, except it's more open, more impactful, and more accessible to everyone, so. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you, Simon. I'm loving all the show and tell that you are able to provide, Julie, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we still have a few minutes, um, so if there are additional questions, uh, feel free to continue to post them in the chat, or you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask our um, presenters. If yeah. there are no questions, um, again, we'll give a little space for people to add. Um, if not, um, we can end the session early and give you a little bit of a break, longer break um, before we resume at one o'clock, but I'll give it another minute or two for, for questions if there are any more. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you all for attending today. We appreciate your time. I'll add another comment as people are trickling out. Um, I did pop this in the chat and I'll, I'll explain a little, is that any, any tra traditional, you know, publishing process involves multiple layers of editing. And the reason that's important, right, is if you're trying to convince um, your executives to um, fund a position like this, um, it really is necessary because it is, it's prevalent in every other facet of publishing that exists, including blogs, including social media typically there's an editor involved. So why wouldn't you do that with OER? When you're building an OER catalog, you want to make sure that you are meeting a certain quality that you can show other faculty that you want to convince to make OERs. You want them to see that they're just as effective as traditional textbooks. They're just as well produced. And an editor is gonna help you um, achieve that. And it's not to say that they need to be perfect right from the get-go. But, um, and that's one of the nice things about OER is you can continue to change them and update them over time. But you do want to make sure that you're producing something that is um, compelling for your, for your other faculty. So just to add that little comment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Josh. I think it is important. Well, I hope, we hope you enjoy the rest of uh, the afternoon as you go and attend uh, the sessions uh, for this year's conference. Really um, so nice to see familiar faces in here and um, looking forward to the success of your OER program as well. So thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you, Regina, okay, to our speaker. <laughs> yes, thank you all to our speakers and each of all each of you for attending. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Um, and those of you who are here, let's see.